Iowa Soybean Association is driven to deliver for Iowa's 40,000 soybean farmers. We're proud to provide objective agronomic research, a helping hand with soil and water stewardship, and timely industry news powered by the Soybean Checkoff. Learn more at IASoybeans.com. Hi, everybody. I'm Paul Yeager. This is the MTOM Show podcast, a production of Iowa PBS and the Market to Market TV show. That's what the swag says. Hey, if you are interested in this program, we do a new MTOM podcast each and every Tuesday. We like, subscribe, watch, download, listen, share. You can do any of those things. I don't really care. I, actually, I do care and would love to hear from you. If you have any feedback for me, send it to me at paul.yeager. That's Y-E-A-G-E-R at iowapbs.org. We'd love to hear from you about where you watch or listen to this podcast and what topics you'd like to see. This is part of the Market to Market TV show. New episodes come out every Friday. If you subscribe to YouTube, you already know the show comes out before it airs, likely on your PBS station. So keep that in mind the next time you want to impress your in-laws and say, well, why wait until Sunday morning to watch Market to Market? We can watch it right now. And right now, we're going to talk about a field day. We're going to go into the field with Lee Tesdell. He's a return guest to the podcast. He is a farmer in North Polk County, Southern Story County, in that area. And he has adopted a lot of uh, conservation practices around clean water. He's now on the Soil and Water Commission of Polk County. So we're going to go out to his field. He's going to give us a tour of the different strips that go from one field to another and what he is trying to do and hopes others do, are doing or will consider to do. He's actually having a field day. There's been four of them throughout the state of Iowa through the month of May. This is coming out after all of those field days are done. But here's the thing. If you want a tour from Lee, you just have to contact him and he'll gladly show you around and talk to you about clean water at any point. That's this week's episode of the MTOM podcast. I noticed on your email, Lee, it says emeritus. Are you done doing that commute to Minnesota? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, Paul, I worked till I was 70 and I thought, well, it's time to come home and spend more time with Cindy and doing farm stuff and gardening. So, uh, yeah, I uh, retired in May 2021. And you were teaching English, right? Right. Technical communication. I uh, was there 19 years at Mankato, uh, Minnesota State Mankato. And um, I had graduated with my doctorate from Iowa State in 99. Yeah. You always were one that would stop. And you. I, I'm guessing you kind of missed the trip a little bit at times when you can't see the you always right. you always intrigued me on that. Well, that looks pretty good here and looks good there. You missed that part of the drive where you could see how all the crops looked. I do, actually. I um, really enjoyed driving up Highway 17. I could go west from our house on 158th over to 17 south of Madrid. And then I took 17 all the way up through Webster City, Eagle Grove, um, all the way up to uh, northern Iowa, and then got on 169 uh, into Mankato. And it, it is an interesting drive, yes. But this has allowed you now to, what, you say, be at home more? Have you actually been at home more? Or are you one of those retired guys that's <laughs> always gone in retirement? Yeah. No, I'm actually at home a lot more. Uh, Cindy appreciates that. that um, now I pick up the eggs and wash them uh, daily. <laughs> <laughs> you got to pull your weight around here. That's right. And at lambing time. And. The the big advantage now, Paul, is I can lamb at a normal time in the in the spring instead of waiting till the semester is over. So uh, we're lambing first uh, of April now, which is a lot better than first of June or middle of May right. or something like that. Uh, right. I keep reading your name in the newspaper. You're still writing some letters about uh, clean water. What you're not shedding the uh, the writing side of your brain. Well. <clears throat> yeah, I probably should be writing more, but you're right. I've written a few things. Um, I I uh, try to stay up uh, on conservation topics and uh, follow the legislature. Um, I did get elected to the Polk County SWCD uh, Soil and Water Con uh, Conservation District last fall, and um, 
And so the, we have monthly meetings and other activities. Um, so uh, I guess you could say I'm more immersed in conservation now than I was before. Yeah. Are there still people interested in serving on the Soil and Water Commission, or is this a look around, who can we get with a pulse? Well, it was a little bit more of the latter. <laughs> that they uh, really appreciated the fact that, that I, I stepped up because they needed that one last uh, candidate. Uh, of course, I had no opponent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But uh, I did get 80, I think 81,000 votes or something, which, uh, you know, pumped my ego up a little bit, but uh, <laughs> no, nonpartisan and, and no can't, no opponent. So uh, it's pretty easy. But, um, but I, 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 I'm not trying to make light of the office. I just know that there are some right. elected spots right now. You could argue right. it's probably the most important time that this office has ever had. Yeah, you could. And um, I, I appreciate that, um, and I, it has been good for connections. I've been a little dismayed that's a little bit more about long meetings and a little less about um, let's get more cover crops on the ground in Polk County, but I guess I should have understood that, right, because there has to be a body that has meetings and directs policy and makes connections, and um so I'm, you know, I, I'm learning as I go, and, um, and we're this field day coming up next week is an example of something that we're helping to sponsor, and um, so we're doing as well as talking, I guess. Well, Lee, we were interrupted uh, there. You have all sorts of people. You're used to people stopping to ask what you're doing around your place, right? Right. right. Yeah, th these people are running an experiment. Um, they're putting honey. Uh, be hives out in one of my prairie strips, and they're just. Uh, I think they're gonna collect data on um, on the um, honeybee activity in prairie flowers this summer. So, and as you well, as you heard me say, I expect some free honey at the end. Of the exactly, day. <laughs> it's all one for the other. We'll go out into your field in a minute and see if they have those bees have anything to work with. Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, Polk County water is. Uh, a topic that there are some that are extremely passionate about and others that give you a, a shoulder shrug. Well, right. How do you get the shoulder shrugs to uh, be less and less? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think about my grandchildren, you know, and I, um, and everyone else's grandchildren. Um, we definitely want them to have uh, clean water and uh, abundant water to drink down the road and uh, so we need to be working today to change our farming practices so that we um, are releasing fewer nutrients into our water uh, into our streams and rivers and um, we need to do our part out here on the on the on the farm acres right uh, for water quality we had a story uh, recently on the show about water quality, and I uh, the, the right, front of it was uh, mentioning that May is going to be some field days in in your area. You're one of the stop sites on the the field right. days. Why are those field days important? Well, I think uh, you, you were just talking about the folks who give a shoulder shrug about water quality. Um, I think it does help. To convince some folks who are don't know much or are a little skeptical um, that there really are practices out here on on the uh, acres that we farm in Polk County that can be put into place that do improve water quality. Um, so, um, and it also gives a chance for uh, politicians or policymakers to mix with. Uh, citizen farmers and um, and so they can listen to each other. Um, I'm a little skeptical of what a friend of mine calls happy talk about conservation. Um, you know, we'll we'll get some of that next week. But but you know, we have to be talking with each other. We can't ignore each other. And even if we don't agree on on uh, you know the five hundred thousand dollars they got moved around for the uh, water testing, the sensors, um, we still have to be uh, talking with each other. So. 
Well, we could do the whole political side of that uh, discussion, but let's right. talk politics here. How did the Iowa legislature do this year on water quality? You've mentioned they're 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 closing down one monitor site, right, and moving that money elsewhere. Yeah, I think there there were a bunch of sites, and um, they're moving the money. I think to the Iowa Nutrient Center. Um, there are actually legislators, I think, who deny that we have a problem. Uh, there are others that understand that we do. And um, I did not follow all the bills that that were concerned with water quality. It, to be honest with you, Paul, it's a little hard to keep uh, track of all the bills and their the various iterations, amendments, and then the, how they end up and whether or not they move on or not to the governor's desk. Um, but generally speaking, I would say that the legislature uh, could have done a lot more to um, protect our water quality uh, from pollution. And um, I think we need to you know, keep after our legislators uh, for better policy. So. Any lawmakers going on these field days so far? Um, there may well be. Um, we, uh, let's see, uh, Secretary of Ag Mike Nag is, con is uh, confirmed for next week. Um, I know that Representative Zach Nunn is interested. He's on the House Ag Committee in Washington, um, and he's been invited. Um, in the past, I have had le state legislators out here for farm uh, tours. Um, don't know if any of them have confirmed or not. Um, do you but, move the needle more when the legislators come or do you move the needle when you have somebody from off the farm that, or <laughs> I shouldn't even say off the farm, someone who doesn't maybe uh, adhere to as much water quality standards as you hold? Yeah, I well, like I said, we have to dialogue with each other and um, whether or not we agree um, and we, and we really have to listen to the scientists, um, what the data and the research that they're providing. Um, and then, and then we just have to keep, um, keep after these practices that we know work, um, like cover crop, no-till, edge of field practices. Um, and then critically, we have to keep testing. Uh, to see if our practices are in fact influencing the quality of the water in the streams and rivers, right? So I can I can tell you how much uh, nitrate I'm taking out of one of my tiles on my farm uh, with a saturated buffer. I, I can give you exact data, but uh, I can't tell you that Four Mile Creek, where it enters the Des Moines River down southeast Des Moines, I can't tell you if it's any cleaner or not than it was, you know, before I put in the saturated buffers. So that that's the critical part. And when the monitors go away, I mean, they weren't really, were there monitors that were duplicated by these three different groups? Or are we just losing another data point when we remove these monitors statewide? Right. I I think we're losing data points. I have been assured that the director of the center at the University of Iowa is a good fundraiser, and we may well be able to continue testing with uh, with sensors. So even though the funding for for those thirty sensors or whatever they are went away. Um, uh, we may be able to continue with with new sensors, so I, we'll we'll have to wait and see how that shakes out. But uh, as far as testing goes, it's difficult for an individual landowner to actually put in place a systematic regime of water testing, even on our own tiles. Uh, that's a service that's not readily available in Iowa. Um, I'm lucky because I have a PhD student from Iowa State who's doing some research. And so Gabe comes out and pulls water samples on my farm regularly. Um, but when he graduates, uh, <laughs> that's that goes away, right? So what is 
are we to the point yet that you feel like there's been victories in water quality? Well, there's definitely been victories on individual tiles on individual farms. Um, you know, I can attest to that with my own data. I have um, a wood chip bioreactor that's been denitrifying at 58%. Uh, it's been going for about 10 years. That data represents only four of those 10 years. And then I have a saturated buffer that was denitrifying at 92%. Um, but again, that was only two years of data. So I can't tell you what the average has been over five years. Um, so, you know, I can confirm those small victories. But again, you know, is Four Mile Creek any cleaner for what I'm doing? I can't prove that. Yeah, not yeah. yet anyway. Yeah. Right. Um, do you, I had a, a longtime farm broadcaster tell me the other day that, or I heard him say, uh, farmers, especially before the inputs went as high as they did there in the last couple of years, that no farmer was putting excess nitrates on or uh, fertilizer onto the field than need be. They're only putting on what the land is supposed to and there and this notion of ah you're just blasting it on and letting it fly willy-nilly is that still a valid argument that there are farmers who might be not good stewards well i don't i don't have evidence to back that up i know i know that uh my neighbors are not all the same right so i know uh so for example when corn follows soybeans you usually, you usually give maybe a 40, 45 pound per acre credit to the soybeans. So maybe you just put on 140 pounds or 150 pounds on the corn that year. Um, I know Tom Eisenhardt at Iowa State says the average for Iowa for nit nitrogen fertilizer, 180 pounds an acre. Um, so that means some people are putting on over 200. Um, there's also naturally occurring nitrate, right? And um, so some of that escapes through the tiles and some of what we apply escapes through the tiles. So uh, because the corn just doesn't use it all. Uh, if you have a dry year, uh, it's not even gonna flow through the tiles because there's no water in the tiles. And then you have what we call a, a nitrate flush, maybe the next spring, right? Uh, before the corn's even growing, um, and then we lose we lose a lot um, in a situation like that. So I can't I can't tell you what exactly what my neighbors are doing. I some are still putting on uh, anhydrous in the fall, quite a few are, um, and some are putting on uh, dry and and uh, liquid uh, in the spring, um, and I'm sure there's a I'm sure they're not all the same. I'm sure some are putting on 200 and some are putting on mm -hmm. 120, 130. Yeah. Did the high prices of anhydrous, do you think, uh, and the results that the farmers may have had go, maybe I don't need to put on? Was that <laughs> Is that going to be a needle mover? Um, I don't know if it's going to be a needle mover. I mean, I, I know I have neighbors that were, were much more careful about how much they ordered. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm sure the input price uh, made a difference. At the same time, they realized you can't make 240, 250 bushel corn without um, a fair amount of nitrogen fertilizer. So, yeah. And that's everybody's goal. You know, it's 240, 250 at least. So. Yeah, that's what the bank uh, wants, uh, to keep your note moving. Uh, yeah. All right, Lee, let's right. go for a tour. You're in your, you're in your pickup now. Uh, right. You're going to grab the phone. So if you're watching yep. this on YouTube, just be with us. We tested this. This should <laughs> all work. He's been in his pickup. He's already been stopped once by the bee folks. And uh, you are on some land in northern Polk County. You're uh, almost right. in uh, – this is, a, I'm just I guess, a just narrate what it is that we have. Right. So I'm just – that's my, my uh, farmstead up there. I'm just – a mile south of the story poke line and uh we're on this uh, 80 acre farm it's the tesdale century farm and uh my grand great grandpa bought this in 1884 
And uh, you can see to the west here that we've got 53 acres of uh, cereal rye. Uh, that's either gonna be um, uh, for cover crop seed or we might plant soybeans into it. Depends on what Nick wants to do. And uh, you can see the Iowa State beekeeper people there putting the bees out in their, in their suits down there. <laughs> when did that rye go in? Uh, that rye went in after harvest last fall, and um, Nick put it put it in with a John Deere air seeder, forty foot John Deere air seeder. It's the same machine they used to plant soybeans with, and uh, you can see where are you getting a pretty yep, good picture? I get a good picture Paul? here. Yeah, great. And you can see we've got pretty nice growth here. We're on the end rows here, right? And then uh, the rows run uh, north and south here on my farm. And you can see we've got pretty decent growth in there. And uh, a little bit of a heading out here a little bit it's right in there. So when you say it might go to seed, but so that would mean you would cut it or would you turn, you're going to let it grow full to term? Right, right. And then you'd probably harvest in July with a, with probably with a bean head. And take the grain for cover crop seed. Then you need to clean it, and um, and then uh, store it for for the fall. And would yeah. anything else? You said soybeans after. When would you plant those beans? Well, when I said soybeans, they they might decide to plant beans here in the next week or two. Oh, I see. Um, right. So they would do. If in that case, they'd be doing what we call planting green. We just pull in here with that same uh, soybean, with that air seeder and plant the beans right into this and then kill it maybe 10 days later with herbicide. And, so. and, and that's special equipment, a uh, little different equipment, I should say, than a tradition. You need to, some of the things need to change a little bit there, right? Well, um, the, I mean, it's the same, the same uh, planter cedar that they used to plant this last fall. So it's, uh, you know, same piece of equipment. Um, and, uh, they've had good success several years ago. We planted green like this and the, you know, the rye was way up here and they pulled in and planted it, uh, right into the rye. Uh, so that it works pretty well. Uh, beans are pretty forgiving. Uh, <laughs> corn, corn doesn't like that so much. <laughs> they don't like the competition. Yeah, that's competition and corn. The people that do corn this way, plant green, they, they put on, I don't know, maybe 40 pounds of um, nitrogen fertilizer uh, when they plant. They say uh, corn needs that little boost. Okay. Then, so now this is some of your your edge of field. Uh, I think you're going to get back into a, what I would call a waterway, but what do you call it? Yeah, so this, I'm um, just showing you the head of a, a prairie plant here. So. This is one of my terraces. I've got four terraces on this farm. And um, we seeded three of them down uh, five years ago to, to Prairie. Uh, you can see a volunteer uh, mulberry down, <laughs> down there. I've got some of those too. Um, but there's loads of prairie plants in here and they're just greening up. They're starting to show up here. And uh, in July, this is just gonna be, a, it's gonna be beautiful with yellow and purple out here and white flowers. Um, I have 60 to 70 different species in here. Um, and every year we find new ones. So, so that is, how long has it been in that state where it's been a prairie? This is five years now. And how long do you and, expect uh, to keep it that way? Well, I just want to leave it forever. Uh, it, I, you can see it's kind of a 40 foot strip here. Um, and I, I did seed each one of my three terraces with with prairie seed, so I, I have basically three uh, three acres of, uh, uh, but each one is a separate strip here. Um, we we had hoped to burn them this this spring, but we didn't get a didn't get it uh, figured out in time, so we'll probably burn these strips this fall. Well, up until about a week ago, it was pretty dry. You, you, you missed that spring uh, window to burn. Wasn't there I this know. year? <laughs> yeah, it was. Well, we had a window here and there, but uh, getting the Huxley Fire Department together with the weather and 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 my uh, presence was, <laughs> was 
turned out to be a little bit of a question. So we'll, we'll get it this fall. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. And the importance of the burning is what? Well, prairie likes to be, uh, burn every several years, so uh, that invigorates the prairie. And uh, as you know, back back in the old days, before Europeans came here, the prairie would burn uh, from time to time, and uh, it's uh, it does invigorate uh, the prairie itself. So, got to do it. And as you keep walking, how far back does this forty foot wide uh, prairie go? So. My farm is a half mile east-west and a quarter mile north-south. So this is a quarter mile. And uh, and then there's two more uh, down that way, same thing. So the prairie goes all the way across to the south edge of the farm. The terraces don't go all the way. So we extended, you know, beyond the terrace uh, when we seeded. So. And then off to the left there, if I get my bearings, what do we have yeah. here on the other side? Yeah, so going east here uh, to the left, like say, this is um, seven acres of Kernza, and you can see we have a pretty decent crop of dandelions in here too. <laughs> but uh, Kernza is a uh, is an intermediate wheat grass, and it's been uh, bred by the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas, as a as a grain crop and a uh, grazing crop, and so. It's kind of an experiment, and uh, we grazed it a little bit last fall. We didn't get any grain last year. We just baled it for cattle feed. I sold the bales, and uh, this year we hope to get some grain. So here's a clump of currants right there, kind of blue-green. And when um, would the harvest of that be? Uh, it should be early August. Okay. And so it, it'll look kind of like oats or wheat, you know. And um, and we think we're going to swath it, and then you let it let it cure a day or two in a swath, and then you combine it off the ground. And then who buys that seed? So my plan is if we actually get anything, my plan is to clean it, uh, hire someone to clean it, dehull it, and bag it. Um, I can sell it to local brewers. I can sell it to um, uh, uh, bakers. Uh, they might need it ground then into flour as well. Um, it has a lot of uses. Uh, brewers like it. They mix it in with uh, malt barley and oats and wheat and triticale and and uh, create their own beers with it. So, and uh, hot cereal is good. Pancake mix. Um, we've had any number of products from Kearns that are quite tasty. And if someone drives by, I mean, you talk about your neighbors and your dialogue, and, and they see this and they go, well, Lee, that, that just looks like a bunch of stuff I don't want. That doesn't look clean. Um, yeah. And, what's your and opening Lee, line and conversation back to someone <laughs> when they say that? Yeah, that's right. And, and also, Lee, why wouldn't you want to maximize your dollars on every acre? <laughs> why are you doing plant corn, man? But uh, I'm doing it as an experiment. This is, uh, it's called a perennial uh, crop, so it'll go for several years. I can graze my sheep out here next fall, which I did last fall. And, um, you know, it's I'm, I'm interested in, in how it turns out. I guess I'm a little bit. Uh, curious about these things, and um, I'd like to see us growing more. Um, oh, there goes a monarch! Oh, first monarch of the year. Um, yeah, um, I like to, you know, I like to uh, see more diversification on our farm ground in Iowa, and this is one possible crop at Kernza that uh, would allow us to make some money and. Um, treat the soil a little bit better and again improve the water quality a little bit uh rather than having uh annual crops mm -hmm. so yeah you always have something then, going on i and oh we got one more here are we what are we coming up to now, now? We're, now we're moving into my alfalfa this is alfalfa orchard grass five acres and um 
we'll hopefully be bailing this the day after the field day. We'll try not to run too much of it over next next week, right? Walking, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, alfalfa looks beautiful this year. You can see you can see the growth here. And uh, you can see the orchard grass here. There's a little bit of orchard grass in with it. And uh, this is what I feed to my sheep all year. So we, we big bale, two or three cuttings, and then we small bale, usually the second cutting, put in the barn. So. And this is, how many, how many acres do you, are you covering here with these three fields? The rye, that waterway, or that prairie, and your uh-huh. kern and your alfalfa. What are we talking here? Well, that's the whole farm, and then include the CRP down along the creek. I've got about eight acres of CRP, so that's the whole farm. That's eighty acres. Um, so I got five acres of alfalfa, seven of Kernza, three acres of prairie strips, and fifty-three acres of cereal rye, and then the CRP down along the creek. So. Lee, I guess I asked you what you would ask your neighbor if they came up, but if I've got somebody that feels like they're on an island and they just don't think that this is something they can do on their own, and I think I asked you this the last time we visited, give someone the boldness to, to try something new. What's what? Give me the elevator pitch here and how you do that. Well, yeah, good question. So, so I'm a landowner and a part-time farmer, the way I look at it is owning a piece of this beautiful Iowa farmland is it's a lot like owning a business and any uh, rental in- income you have off your off your uh, acres, you know, you should be reinvesting, uh, not not just buying a new pickup. You know, you should be reinvesting every year. And and I see this as reinvestment, trying new crops, uh Sure, I'm not going to make much money on this Kernza. I know that already. Um, but to me, it's an investment in the future. And um, as landowners, I think we need to be doing that. Does that make sense? It does, Lee. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. I guess we should put you back on camera so we can get you outstanding in your field. We want to make sure we uh, get that last shot there. So, Okay. Well, Lee, right. thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll get your hand away there, and then I can get you a big smile at the end. And, uh, How's that? Looking good, Lee. Thank you so much, and uh, have fun at your field day. All right. Thanks, Paul. My thanks to Lee. Good to have a conversation with him and see what he has cooking on his farm. New episode comes out next Tuesday. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.